wanted to join the military from a young age. My dad's in the army, followed him around the world and just had that experience with the military that sort of drew me in and then went through school always knowing that I wanted to join the military. And then joined the RAF in 2009 as a weapons technician. Ever since I joined the military and rugby became a passion, my role became sort of primarily rugby. I did serve Coningsby and Bryce Norton as a weapons technician, but sort of with the main goal of, of being a rugby player. And then for the last six years, my first role, my primary role in the Air Force has been playing professional rugby. In rugby especially, I think there's a massive pathway for guys coming out of school, under 20s, they come that way. Whereas I think there's also a, quite a good pathway from the military. There's guys fit, like played good rugby in school and joined into the military. There's a good gap that we can bridge, getting more guys into those environments. So hopefully I can go back, share some knowledge and, and bridge that gap to, to get more people out there. Fucking out. Corporal in the RAF. showed his way through, one stretch and he'll score. That's an extraordinary try for the second row. Saracens um, at Allianz Park, played 80 minutes, came off the pitch, felt absolutely fine, driving home, just started having a bit of irritation and like my eyesight here and things like that. And, just thought it was like a delayed concussion, just thought like concussion was so big. Got home, started to have like really weird like feelings, like fell through the front door. My wife Sarah just sort of asking like what was going on. She thought I was drunk and like basically I couldn't comprehend what was going on, couldn't articulate that to her as well. She rings our doctor at London Irish and he's like we, we've got no idea like he left the game fine ring an ambulance so by the time from that point where i started to have an episode i keep calling it is i had like 30 minutes like travel to hospital and by the time i got to hospital i was absolutely fine and like no one there was no signs lasting signs that i'd had anything wrong with me whole weekend and get to monday tuesday of testing every test under the sun mri scan everything um, and they work out that I'd actually got scar tissue on the brain and I'd actually had a stroke after the game. You hear the word stroke, so you're just like, oh my God, like that's horrendous. But for me personally, like it was just a little wobble. I had a 30 minute episode and it was absolutely fine. I had no lasting effects after that. So for the biggest thing for me to be able to play rugby again, it was, I like we needed to find a cure. You can't just keep taking the rugby field and having strokes. So I, went down so many different avenues, trying to work out why, so many different tests. And then you start having these conversations again, that, like your head of medical doctors start having these sort of like, oh, well, okay, like maybe like might have to retire. Like, so then you start going down that and I was just like, this can't be right. Like I can't, there's absolutely nothing wrong with me. Like Sarah was so positive and just was like, we'll, we'll find an issue. Like we'll, we'll find out what caused it. So, very, very luckily, like a guy in the, the RAF, a friend of mine, um, Ross Billing, actually had had this before. He, he messaged me and just said, look, I've heard you've had a stroke. I've had a stroke as well. Uh, do you know what caused it? Like mine was from a PFO, which is a hole in the heart. <clears throat> Hadn't heard anything about this. I was like, oh, this might be actually an avenue. Got to speak to our doctors again. Look, can we just get a test for this? Um, Next day, test, found a hole in the heart. So immediately, all the doctors that were doing the test were like, oh, really unfortunate, like you have got a hole in the heart. For us, it was like the best news ever because that was a cure, it was curable, and it meant I could continue on a process to get recovered. So had the operation, three months on um, sort of blood thinning drugs to help it heal, and then bang, I was back playing. And yeah, it was a, it was a very, very scary time, but I think for me personally, I've got a pretty sort of no worries attitude. I always sort of just push through and think, oh, it will be all right, it'll get through it. And I, I genuinely like, I was in like denial for ages, which probably helped a little bit because that phase of like the unknown for the first few weeks was probably like, I was so in denial that there was anything wrong with me. 
I was very lucky having a stroke and not having any lasting effects, even to the to the few minutes after it happened, like there was no real lasting effects, no weaknesses, no loss of vision. And I just was like, sort of had an attitude to be like, I'm not giving up sort of thing. And that, that was probably the doing of Sarah really, because she just kept going, look, it's fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with you. Like, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. Like, we'll keep pushing. And no one really had that negativity around me to be like, oh, maybe you should retire. Like, it isn't safe. Like, maybe you should like, and you put, you extend that two week period out to a couple of months and then that might creep in. But I was very lucky and only having a couple, sort of a two week period of thinking, oh, like, is it the end? But the people around me probably dragged me through that to, to allow me to, to get to where I am now. So yeah, it was, I'm pretty stubborn in the way that I feel at things and I'll always try and find the positive stuff and try and push through like, it's, it's fine, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. And that probably helped massively. It's a, it's a major flaw in my own personality to, to be like that as well. But in that situation, it was probably, probably a bit of a positive. The military and professional sport, especially team sports, have got a lot of, like, there's a lot in common, um, sort of like leadership and, and team skills, sort of cohesion as a group and things like, a lot of that sort of comes together. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd say the RAF has definitely brought the skills that I've, I've sort of showed here at Bath. The military bring that out of you, bring those qualities out of you, and I think it comes quite natural to me, those sort of leadership sort of roles. So trying to just bring that as much as I can here. Like I'm not the most experienced player. Like we've got British and Irish Lions here, we've got internationals, premiership, European winners here, but just try and bring a different view on things and um, just bring those leadership skills out that hopefully take us to a better place. We've got a pretty decent leadership group here that we've been working a lot that now we like try and come together. Um, if something's happened on the pitch or um, there's a, a decision to be made. We, we try and come together, three, four of us, and just try and sort of hash that decision out because you have such a different view on everything. As a forward, as a back, forwards are sort of in a very insular, like very focused on their own game. Backs have a bit more time to see the bigger picture. And I think we've got a great balance here of coming together and understanding how we fix that problem. I think in the past, we've can solely rely on one person. A lot of people stay quiet and one, de one decision can rest on the shoulders of one person. So I think we've done a lot of work to, to try and share that load. And um, it's seen, we've seen like live examples on the pitch of just how that can work and how decisions can get changed and um, like outcomes become a lot, a lot more cleaner and more positive based on like decisions we've made as a group rather than just individuals saying this is how it's going to happen. Rugby is obviously a very, very emotional sport. And when we come into huddles, trying to control that emotion from players is extremely important. We have huddles before where players are extremely hemped up and want to just talk and want to just give out messages when it's probably not the right time to. And then on the other side, some people might not be quite there and won't be giving out messages. So we've worked hard on bringing in huddles, um, trying to everyone to take a breath and then we can get the messages across. We can come together as those leaders, control that emotion, get the right messages across and we get much cleaner huddles. Um, without that, it can become very, very frantic and we can get mixed messages, um, especially when things sort of come from the sidelines as well. So controlling that, coming into huddles is, is massively important and just getting the message across that needs to be said uh, at the time. I've got a very different mindset in the sense that I'm here and I don't want to waste an opportunity. There's so many, it's probably the, like the reason we talk about the, the why's, we talk about why you want to play rugby and I think I've been given such a great opportunity from the RAF that so many guys in the RAF would love to do, love to be in my position that I never want to waste that for them. Like I do it so much for the guys there that have probably watched me do this for a few years and just are willing me to do well and I never want to waste that. I never want to let them down by just sort of um, swanning it away basically, just like, yes, yeah, I'm just doing this for a laugh, like it's class being a professional sport, like I want to be here to win stuff and take and go back to the RAF as look at what I've like thanks very much, like look at what I've achieved while I've been out doing this.